Hi, I'm recording this video on a Sunday morning and my discussion is going to be about the idea of culture video and how those things can play into our own biases, our own perspectives. I want to be sharing some uh, academic and you know scholarly information certainly, but I'm also going to be uh, sharing some personal information towards the end of this video. So as, and it's not just personal information, it's personal relationship, personal information that relates to my own professional uh, life. And so my hope is that by sharing my own experiences, my own, uh, you know, ways that I've confronted my own biases in practice um, and in personal life that, you know, you may also feel free to explore your own experiences and to examine them in light of how, how is this going to affect um, not just my views on play, but my how I work with family. So this is a slight departure from the reflection question, which is asking you to think about how your culture and your gender, how basically how, how your life has affected your views of play. But this video is meant to be sort of an extension um, as you think more broadly about how our views can affect our work and affect our relationships and affect our views and perspectives. So I want to begin by talking about um, a theory of, <clears throat> of development that was developed by Lawrence Kohlberg um, in the 70s. And Dr. Kohlberg had, um, has a theory, had developed a theory on moral development. <clears throat> and it was aligned with Piaget's theory of cognitive development, it, it aligned very closely to the way that uh, Piaget had um, formulated an idea of how people learn. It's called an epistemology. And then also he developed this idea, these ideas about how um, children learn specifically and, and those stages that um, children go through on their way to a mature idea of intelligence. And so um, Kohlberg's ideas of moral development were... Um, formulated to conceptualize how people come to ideas of ethics and morals and integrity and things like this. And so what Colbert did was he um, interviewed boys ages 10 to 16 and asked them a question. It was called the Heinz Dilemma. And some of you have probably heard of this. It's sort of an ethical, uh, logical quandary that's similarly told across cultures and you know and so Kohlberg posed this question it was the idea that if a man named Heinz uh, had a wife who was dying of cancer and a chemist had developed a certain drug that would heal her <clears throat> but it was extremely expensive ultimately should Heinz steal the drug to save his wife or should he not steal it Within the dilemma, Heinz uh, has talked with a chemist and asked questions of him, uh, has raised some money from other people, but the chemist won't relent on the price of the drug. <clears throat> and so the idea then is that he's faced with, you know, allowing his wife to die or stealing the drug to save her life. And so Kohlberg posed this question to these boys and developed this uh, set of uh, the sort of framework that, that identified the stages that children develop through and the individuals develop through on their way to this idea of moral um, understanding. And so within his framework, uh, Kohlberg had come up with three stages, and the highest stage hardly anyone would um, ever achieve to. He said something like 10 to 15 percent of all people would ever get to that uh, highest level of morality, which was based on a personal set of ethics and, and justice, which really didn't have anything to do with a social idea. It was a, a person's internal idea about, um, you know, justice and, um, and ethics. And so, um, that was sort of an established, understood framework for moral reasoning, again, based on a cognitive developmental framework that, uh, Piaget had put forth. So um, this was accepted. I remember in my undergraduate work hearing about Kohlberg's uh, theory of moral development, and I studied at Baylor University. And so, um, you know, it was, <clears throat> it's a Southern Baptist school, very, um, 
patriarchal in its framework <clears throat> because it's, it's based on, a, it's a private Christian school, so it's based on that. So I was studying psychology. We studied Kohlberg. We studied Piaget. We studied all of the, the greats, you know, Eric Erickson, all of those. Um, but I had never heard of a criticism of Kohlberg, though it there there had been more than one and one really significant uh criticism to Kohlberg, which then led to a different uh, theoretical viewpoint. And that was posed by Dr. Car Dr. Carol Gilligan. She published a book in 1977 called In a Different Voice. And um, basically Gilligan's criticism, and, and she really came from a place of understanding from having worked with Kohlberg. She worked under him as a, a you know, a, an assistant, a graduate assistant. So she studied with him, and then she'd also worked with Erickson. So she was very familiar with these men's, um, you know, developmental uh, frameworks. So Kohlberg, I mean, uh, Gilligan's book, In a Different Voice, was published in 1977, and she basically took to task a couple of different things in both Erickson's uh, framework and um, Kohlberg's framework. And probably part of why many of you have never heard of Goldberg, really. Um, one thing with Erickson that, if, if you'll remember his stages of his psychosocial theory, um, one thing that Gilligan pointed out is that Erickson recognized in, within the framework, because of his research, that girls seem to progress through the stages of psychosocial development at a slightly different uh, order. Um, that relationship is prioritized within uh, women in, in our trajectory, but whether or not that is socialized or if that is a genetic thing wasn't really the point. But Erickson, despite knowing this and seeing this in the research, had not changed his theory and so had continued with the theory for everyone as though there were no differences within uh, men and women in their development. <clears throat> the other thing, too, that Gilligan took to task with Kohlberg's theory was that it was uh, developed solely with um, males. There were only boys that were interviewed, and they were, you know, preteen to teenage boys. And so, um, the idea of, of these stages of development were developed, you know, from a male-centric point of view. Not only had boys been sampled and interviewed. But Kohlberg himself had, had determined the order and which was the highest level, which prioritized uh, justice. Well, Gilligan's uh, research actually was done with a couple of different groups. And so she also interviewed, um, you know, young kids like 10, 11, 12 years old, boys and girls. And she also interviewed women who were preparing to... Um, get abortion. So she was interviewing women who were in the process of making the decision about whether or not they wanted to uh, pr proceed with an abortion, that they had uh, were kind of at that stage of what do I do next. And so there were two things that she found through her research. One was that, yes, boys tended to, to proceed towards a, 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 a morality centered on justice and that they were using a great deal of logic in their reasoning. Um, with girls, however, she looked at it very differently uh, because girls seem to prioritize relationship. In the Heinz Dilemma, girls would say things like, well, through communication, um, Heinz should talk to the chemist, and he, you know, no one should die, uh, you know, but he also shouldn't steal, because if he were to be jailed, his wife might need him, and he wouldn't be there. So it was a preservation of relationships in that that neither thing was acceptable. In Kohlberg's view, that kind of equivocal answer where it could be either or was actually not seen as a preferable or a mature stage in moral development because of that, you know, it has to be one or the other, not both. <clears throat> but Gilligan saw that very differently. She saw that, you know, what with girls, uh, what they were looking at was how there was no great... Uh, or, or clear choice because it would hurt everyone. The wife would die if the chemist didn't give the medication. The man would be jailed if he stole the drug and the wife might still suffer and the husband would suffer as well. So they were, they were looking at relationship and the ethics of care 
and compassion within their own idea of morality. And she kept coming back to that, that it was really about uh, sort of a difference in viewpoint that Kohlberg was prioritizing justice while Gilligan er, was noticing that the girls were prioritizing compassion and care. So it was, it was a way of criticizing Kohlberg's assessment of things. Now, also with the other uh, participants in her study who were, you know, at the abortion clinic who were trying to make that decision, what Gilligan found was that these were women who were also prioritizing uh, care and compassion and connection. And that became a key uh, point of her uh, theory of development, which is, we look at that, is, it's called uh, relational feminism. <clears throat> so Gilligan found that, you know, again, one of her, one of the criticisms that, that had been put forth about Kohlberg is, you know, if we create hypothetical situations uh, for people to sort of try and answer, especially really young kids to try to answer, we're not going to get probably what they would really do because they weren't really faced with a dilemma. It was a dilemma that was, uh, you know, hypothetical and arbitrary. But that if she talked with people who actually were in the midst of, an, of a moral and ethical dilemma, she wanted to know what, what their thought process was like and without interfering in the thought process, just sort of in, interrogating that, um, those ideas. And so um, one of the things that she was able to do was to talk with the women through the the decision-making process and what she found was that in each case the women were considering not just the decision that they were about to make which would have been devastating to themselves um but the the repercussions of that decision if she if they didn't make it as well some of the women were you know involved in relationships that were um extramarital so they were you know having they were pregnant with a child of their lover who did not want them to have the child because it would disrupt their lives. And so they were making a difficult decision to, um, to choose one relationship over another. And so the relationship that they chose, if they chose to bear the child, would ultimately end the relationship that they had with their lover. But then also would ending the pregnancy would probably also end the relationship as well because they were being forced into such a difficult situation. There were other situations as well, uh, women who already had children and were perhaps uh, very um, stretched financially. And so they and their husbands were struggling with the idea of having the child and, and what that might do to their current uh, household situation, their current relationship with their present children and with one another. There were women who were in school who knew that bearing the child would force them to um, abandon school. And just generally, uh, difficulties within all of these relationships. Again, the women were very clear-eyed about ending a pregnancy would also end that part within themselves that would also be terminating that life. So they were all, it was never an easy decision in any of the, in any of the interviews, but they were very aware of this crossroads that they were at and that this decision would have repercussions. And so all of those repercussions affected relationship. So in each case, they were questioning, how do I stay in connection with the people I'm in relationship with? And how do I stay in connection with myself and going forward with the decision that I've made? So it was, it's a fascinating read. Again, the book is called In a Different Voice. It's since been um, reissued. Uh, I believe it was 1993 was the second reissue. And Dr. Gillingen has, um, <clears throat> from that research and also from continuing research, her theory has evolved. And so relational feminism initially, uh, what Gilligan felt that, or what she theorized initially, was that women, the crisis of development for women, and again, this was kind of in response to Erickson's ideas and then Kohlberg's ideas, was that for women, in her original iteration of the theory, she saw the crisis of connection as, or the crisis, yes, the crisis of connection as being, you know, the maintaining of connection as being the big crisis of development. And you can see where that would come from if you've studied Erickson. Erickson takes uh, development through these stages. There are eight stages that are discrete and that build upon one another throughout the life course. But at each uh, 
stage, there is a crisis of development. My particular research was focused on the school age crisis of development and that um, industry versus inferiority, that feeling of children desiring to learn something and to feel competent and confident in their uh, new knowledge. Well, again, Gilligan took that and, and sort of spun that very differently and said, no, men and women are different. And so women's crisis of development is lifelong. It's the maintaining connection. And so we need to look at, at development differently, she said. Now, her, her theories evolved. And, you know, since we've already studied neuroscience, you can see where um, we have new understanding of neurological development now. And uh, Gilligan's theory continued through the 90s and then on into the 2000s. And her current uh, theory of relational feminism really says that all people, because we now have this research that shows that boys and girls are both born with the ability to connect and desire connection. And as an early intervention specialist, I can attest to the fact that, you know, we, we definitely see a difference in development when children are born um, and chil that, you know, that are typically developing and children that are, you know, perhaps have autism who are neuroatypical. But that is, uh, we pretty much see across the board that children who are typically developing you know, they're engaging in eye contact. Eye contact continues to grow at two months. And I'll talk more about this when I do my video lecture on um, children with special needs and their play. Uh, the point here is that research has shown us consistently that children are born with the ability to connect. Again, unless there is some uh, neurodevelopmental disability that causes that inability to con to have connection, like the the inability to to maintain eye contact, is a is a really significant um, point of connection. But what what Gilligan found through research, as as infant research, as developmental research continued, was that boys and girls were born equally able and desiring to connect with others. And so her theory changed to we're all able to connect, that all people are born with the ability to connect and the desire to connect with one another. And that really should form our understanding of humanity and development. And that is that uh, development of connection, that encouragement of connection that actually is, is important through the lifespan. And also, you know, when we think about trauma research, we know that connection is what heals people. It is the point of of healing for people who've experienced trauma. Connection is key. Relationship is key. Relationships are protective. Now, why do I tell you this story when we're talking about play? What does this have to do with anything else to do with culture and gender and bias? Well, you may have picked up that you have a point of, um, of frameworks and developmental frameworks and theory that then guide research, that then guide the way that people approach practice. One would, well, we, I talked about four different uh, theories, right? We talked about Erickson and how he saw the difference in, in men and women, but he didn't change his theory. It still had that patriarchal sort of that masculine bias within it, right? And then we also t heard about Kohlberg, who, again, only used men in his samples or boys in his samples. And then he himself came from a, a masculine or a male bi bias again, a patriarchal bias. And so there we had two major theories that were guiding uh, research and practice. And we're also, um, especially with Kohlberg, sort of looking at women as sort of less than because women almost never got to those mature stages of his theory, of his developmental framework. And then we had Gilligan, who also came back with a very different view of things. And she saw it as you know, women were really socialized to be compassionate and caring. And so our developmental uh, f timeline really differed and should be viewed very differently. So, you know, almost if you went through that, uh, that framework at that time, you would say, well, women need to be educated very differently then. Or we need to examine why it is that women are so compassionate and men are so not compassionate. Well, her later research then did reveal 
um, and I won't go too much into it. You can always read for yourself kind of where that research came from and where it went to. But this idea that boys actually are socialized to be disconnected. And again, in, in most uh, male-centered developmental frameworks, that it's called individuation, that separation from others, that, that standing alone and being a sort of individual is the highest form of development. But Gilligan was putting forth this other idea that really the highest form of development should be connection and relationship. So it was, it was taking that and allowing that theory to develop over time and seeing the importance of recognizing that both men and women, both boys and girls, were capable of connection and desiring of connection. And now, you know, as an interventionist, I can say that, you know, and again, I'll talk about this when we talk about um, children with special needs, that our interventions with uh, children who have neurodevelopmental differences is really based on connection. The research is there for that. So having said all of that, uh, it's important that we understand that that our theory should be examined very critically and our research should be examined very critically. And guess what? Our practice should be examined very critically. And I'm going to use some personal examples of how I've done that myself and how this is going to help you in your reflection post as you think about where have I come from? What what thoughts have, have been you know, sort of in my sort of environment, my ethos, you know, that have sort of come out of how I, how I do what I do and how I think about the things that I'm processing or the work that I'm doing, you know, how is that influencing me in a way that influences my judgment, my perspective? So I want to start with telling you about early in my practice before really I had been trained as a practitioner. I was still learning. I was 20 years old and I grew up in Waco, Texas. Uh, something really important to know about me is my father struggled with mental illness. And uh, if you've ever experienced mental illness yourself or you, you have a family member who has raised you with mental illness, um, you know it's more nuanced than the portrayals on television. It's not, um, it's not people who can't uh, maintain a relationship or who can't think beautifully. Um, but, but people who do have dysfunction in the way that they are um, getting along in the world. There's things that can be critical, um, uh, things, critical triggers for them or critical periods for them that really um, cause them to have disruptions in their day-to-day -day life. And that was true for my father. And he did have some, some periods of, of psychoses and some periods where his, his thinking was uh, dysfunctional. And so um, being raised by someone who had been dysfunctional and also being raised in, in poverty where, um, you know, and also being raised in the, the context in which I was raised, just the social and historical period of time. I was born in 1970, just on the, the end of the women's liberation movement and civil rights movements. And um, my parents were very much um, aware of all of those things. And I had been raised in a very, um, uh, you know, female friendly place. My father didn't treat me any differently. Uh, because I was a girl, I was given lots of opportunities and I had a poster on my wall that said hooray for women's lib and um, just things that had permitted me to be completely female and also not limited necessarily by my femininity or my gender. And so um, growing up within that environment, also an environment of poverty as well, um, did inform my viewpoints and I was very fortunate that my parents um, had moved us to an area that was very integrated, very multicultural. Um, I did not grow up in a, a super white kind of a way and I also grew up uh, at a time when that you know it was the 70s and my teenage years were the 80s so um, that was kind of a unique period of time in Texas and in the United States and in the world, you know, seeing uh, things happen over the course of my life, kind of the end of the Cold War and seeing as I was growing up, you know, the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall and things like that, that were really crucial and really important uh, to our society. At any rate, 
I found myself at 20 working in um, a rape crisis program. I just felt at the time I, I was deeply a uh, spiritual person. and deep, Well, I'm not saying I'm not spiritual now, but <laughs> deeply religious, I suppose, would be one way to put it. And um, I felt led to <clears throat> serve as a rape crisis counselor. I had two roles in that uh, particular position. And one of those was to go, um, I carried a beeper around, that's how long ago it was, and I carried a beeper, a pager, and um, when someone was raped or assaulted and they went to the emergency room, it was my role to go and meet them there and to um, comfort them and to talk them through what was going to be happening uh, through that process. And so I met uh, different people through that role. And um, the other role that I fulfilled was um, as a, a hotline telephone uh, person and so I would an I would uh, receive phone calls uh, through the hotline that we had the rape crisis hotline and so I would also talk people through um, their distress and if I could if they if that was what they were needing would offer them resources to help them so you know it was a, a voice in the middle of the night and we got calls from different uh, different places different people different ages of people and just different uh, different circumstances. It wasn't always someone who had just been raped or assaulted. It could be different things too because we were available. And it was a 24-hour hotline, so um, there was always someone manning those calls, and I did that probably more frequently. Um, I was on call a lot for the emergency room visits as well, but I, I did the hotline more frequently just because of the nature of what that was. Um, at any rate, at 20, living in Waco, where the uh, crisis center was located. Um, I was often asked to fill in during holiday breaks and spring break and things like that because most of the university students who served at this center uh, would go home. And so since I, I was at home, you know, I, I was asked, could I fill in? And so on one of these occasions, uh, I received a call that we, there was a person who had gone to the emergency room and she was homeless and drug addicted, um, her homelessness was as a result of her drug addiction, and she had been raped at um, a halfway home where she had stayed, like a shelter kind of thing, where she had stayed a couple of days before. And so they asked me to go to the emergency room, which I did. Um, and so meeting with her, I think, was probably one of the most transformative things in my life because up to that point, you know, I had been... A, a dutiful, you know, Southern Baptist girl and had had very little experiences with people who were, well, I, I think the only experiences I had with people who were homeless was really just people who um, were sort of walking the streets, you know, in Waco and around the ministry where I worked. I worked for a preschool ministry and so I would see uh, people at, that would come to visit the homeless shelter or the um, soup kitchen that was around the corner from the church where I worked and um, you know so it was the experiences I had were limited my parents were very fearful and um, had sort of kept us away and you know kind of had a viewpoint about people who were homeless and so that was kind of I think as I processed through my experience, that was kind of one of those things that I had to confront was, you know, kind of the messages I had heard about people who were homeless. And so I had to think on that. Um, the drug addiction aspect of that was also something I had never uh, personally had experience with. I, and of course, like every other teenager, I had had experiences with people who were at my school and who'd used drugs, but not someone who was um, very deeply engaged in addiction and what that toll that had taken on um, a person's life to result in homelessness. And she was also a lesbian. She identified as a lesbian. And so, um, again, being deeply religious and, and also within that uh, viewpoint at that time, you know, the idea within the Southern Baptist uh, belief system is that homosexual people will are sinful, right? And so... It was one of those things that was ingrained in my understanding. So I'm going to this place who, you know, I'm going to the emergency room, which is in itself a stressful situation. I'm preparing myself and stealing myself for what 
I may be dealing with, as you can imagine, how will I prepare the person that I'm about to meet for what um, is going to happen? And so there is sort of an internal stress about that. And thankfully, there I wasn't alone. There was a, a leader of a, a ministry there in Waco who himself had been drug addicted and homeless, and he had created a ministry to help people who were in those situations to get help. And so when he and a couple of other people there uh, were there to meet me, my role was, was strictly to help her through the exam and through what was going to happen. His role was to get her help. And so he had a couple of other people with him, but they could not transport her to the next location where they were going to then get her to a, a facility that had um, like a rehabilitation facility to help her to detox. So I had no knowledge of this ministry. I was, I was really grateful to know about it, but uh, they'd asked me would I drive her in my car. And so I did. I'd, I really wasn't as worried about that. That really didn't bother me. Um, but it was, it was this particular incident I, that I hadn't been prepared for in my training. I just didn't know what to do at this point. Um, and I, again, I had to process this as what is this feeling and why am I feeling this way and where did these, these thoughts come from was um, we went back to their facility and they had bought pizza and they invited all of us to eat with them and, and they talked with this uh, woman and she was, you know, going to be coming down pretty soon uh, from her, uh, you know, she, she hadn't had any drugs in kind of a while and, and I believe alcohol was a big part of this too and as you can imagine, uh, there was a time frame where, where we needed to really move before she became very um, uncomfortable and, you know, and, and that this situation became more dangerous for her health as well. And so um, they fed her. They talked with her. The man who led the ministry was very observant of, of her clothing and just kind of what she'd been through. And he, he, he developed a point of connection with, they said, I see you're wearing two pants, two pairs of pants. And I remember those days when I was on the street during these cold times when I had to wear two pairs of pants and, and keeping yourself warm and finding this. It was just a fascinating thing to listen to the conversation that he was having with her. And then what happened next was what really got me, was that um, as they were preparing to, to usher her to the next transportation that would take her on to the, to the rehabilitation facility, he embraced her and um, everybody around there embraced her. And I was kind of standing sort of back and did not feel that I could. And the whole time I'm listening to him speak with her, the whole time I'm watching this exchange and I'm feeling very uncomfortable within myself that I didn't just open my arms and embrace her. Excuse me, so I had to kind of think about that. Why was I so uncomfortable? Why was I not comfortable with embracing her? And like I said at the beginning of this, it was some of those biases that I had through through the religion, uh, the religious training I had had, you know, was the discomfort with her sexuality. It was fears of contamination, you know, it was the fear of, of touching someone. And I had to examine where did that come from? Where did I feel that? And it was my own, you know, sort of upbringing and things that had been said to me about people who are homeless and, and being dirty and things like that. And no doubt she had slept on the streets, of course, but she had also been in a, a halfway home or a shelter the past couple of days. So she really, she just needed a hug, right? And so I had to think on that, like, why did that create such discomfort within me? And so, you know, in the years that came, you know, as I developed into my practice and started working with families in early childhood intervention and in education um, in both faith-based programs and then also in secular programs as well, I really had to examine my beliefs and what was, what was humane, what was, um, what was the, the discomfort that came up within me. I had to examine those places where when I was with a family or with a child, where was the discomfort or where was the comfort too? Another example, when I worked in early childhood intervention in the 90s, um, as I said, we lived in poverty and some of the happiest days of my life had actually been living in a mobile home. 
um, my family was, you know, my dad had served in Vietnam. He had some PTSD and um, they, he, he had some difficulty keeping a job for a, a long time. And so, you know, living in a mobile home was a, a, an economical uh, way to live. And, and we lived on some land near my uncle and had a lovely childhood. I didn't know that we were poor, um, but we had what we needed. And um, we had family close by to help to fill the gaps when we didn't have what we needed. And, um, you know, there were periods of time when homelessness was a reality or a fear for us because the banks would call and, and my parents couldn't make their house payment. So again, going back to uh, the experience with this woman who's homeless, I also had to confront my own fears of that could have been me, you know, the scariness of, of that and the and the media narrative that had been built around homelessness and, and the growing uh, crisis of this in the 80s in the United States. So there was that. Working early childhood intervention in the 90s, um, one thing that I, I realized about myself was I was different from my colleagues in some ways. I was very comfortable going into modest homes, into, into homes where there was poverty. And, uh, you know, when I go into home visits that were in mobile homes or in mobile home parks, I was completely at ease. In fact, more so and felt very much at home in many of those places than I did when I went to the executive homes where um, very wealthy people work that I found myself feeling extremely discomfort, extreme discomfort going into homes where people were very wealthy. And I had to confront that as well. And I, and I went back to my own experiences growing up when my family and I had been excluded or treated very poorly by people with money. And so, you know, it was that kind of thing of, I'm going to have to deal with people of all walks of life. And so I need to confront where I'm comfortable, where I'm not comfortable where I experience bias in my work, you know, where is that? It might be that the bias is, is for people who are, uh, you know, more, com more humble. But the people who are wealthy need, need people to come and work with them too, right? So it was confronting all of that. It was thinking about all of those things. Thinking about where um, my faith you know, where it co co you know, where it coincided with the work that I was doing, where it also confronted the work that I was doing, where it also worked against the work that I was doing. And so those were all things about culture and about view and about um, experiences that I had to, to really work through. Um, one thing that was an advantage to me is having grown up in poverty and, and having so few experiences with travel and, and just seeing the world was when I did work with multicultural uh, families or when I worked with families who were, who were immigrants, I was always very fascinated and wanted to hear their story of how their family had come together, how they'd come to the United States. Tell me about your land. That curiosity uh, for families really, uh, for them felt like investment and interest. And, and it was, but for them, you know, I wasn't asking because I was just like, uh, wide-eyed and, and wondering about this, they felt like I was interested in them. And, and it, it, in, it inadvertently became this point of con connection, you know, like, and I really was invested and interested, but I was also so fascinated, you know. And so it became this thing throughout my career where I learned that if you ask anyone, doesn't matter if they're from here or not, or if they have a different background from myself, you know, I could ask people, tell me your story. Because I had heard so many lovely stories and so many interesting or some heartbreaking stories and still do hear those in my practice. But um, asking someone, how, how did you come to develop this, you know, unique uh, outlook that you have on life or how, how did your family come together? Tell me about, you know, this, this lovely place that you've come to be in, you know, tell me about who you are and how you've, uh, developed these, this outlook on life. These were things that I didn't just turn that interest and that curiosity towards people who were different from me, but towards everyone. And so, you know, now my practice is really based on relational feminism, this idea that, um, 
you know, I'm looking for places of connection. And it works very well in a rural community because, um, especially in the position I'm in now, there has been a lot of turnover because um, pay is not great for early intervention specialists. So I'm taking time to get to know the families. I want them to know I'm here, that I'm listening, that I'm active in my listening, and that I'm intentional in my determination to form relationship. I share whatever I'm comfortable about sharing about myself with them. And then I also want, but, but you know, it's always at the, at the, uh, that's secondary to me finding out their story. I want to know who they are. But to get to that place, I've had to work through a lot of, um, you know, some of the belief systems that I've had and, and, and some of the dysfunctional thoughts that, you know, I was exposed to because of my father's mental illness. You, it just it was part of what do I believe? What do I know? What do I understand? What is my perspective and what is my framework for looking at the world? And, you know, it, quite frankly, cynicism, there, it just really, there isn't a place for that in working with families. It's not really a very healthy place to work with families from. So I've always had to confront in over 30 years now, I've had to be very confrontational with myself when cynicism has crept in. Why are you feeling cynical? And if there is some, uh, you know, external reason for that, I need to work through that. So all of this to say that this isn't uh, really a discussion of how boys and girls play differently. This isn't really a discussion of play um, so much as it is a discussion of bias and belief and perspective. So I hope that this discussion of, you know, all it's kind of, I know, a wide ranging discussion, but I hope that this has been helpful to you as you formulate a response to this week's prompt. Um, I really do want you to think critically about what is it that I understand? Where Where is the, the framework, the research how has it been formed? Where, where is it in my mind? Where is it in my body? Where is it in my thought? Because until I had read criticisms of those, you know, foundational developmental paradigms and understood where it came from, I had not thought critically within myself about any of those paradigms. And, and it also, once we start looking at these paradigms and looking at from the framework that they are coming from, uh, I, I became more interested in the in the theorists and their own experiences and where they came from and how that had influenced their paradigms as well. If we're going to adopt a paradigm for play, if we're going to adopt a paradigm for practice, whether that's clinical work or education or child life or early intervention specialists, we need to understand where that framework has come from and what criticisms have there been of that framework. Where is our... Um, where is the intersection between that person's own belief system and what research has said? Because research can, can be very subjective as well. So again, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Um, it isn't meant to undermine you in any way or to accuse in any way, but it's meant to be a point of let's think within ourselves about what we believe and why we believe what we do. It's meant to be a point where you can sort of think in a, in a deconstructive way about the things that you think. So here's what I hope. I hope you'll think about this, maybe take a moment and you know examine some of your own thoughts and your, your upbringing and you know where you've come from not, and where also where are you going to? Because I think about those things as well, and they are very vital to my practice. So, uh, I, I'm looking forward to reading your reflections. I really am interested in hearing your thoughts and, and how this has touched you, um, how this affects you. And also, you know, the articles that you're reading, again, a couple of them are, are going to also talk about bias within uh, the, their context. So, this is important to our work. All right. I look forward to reading your posts.